This is a short story about how memories can come back to us suddenly um, and we can realise that things that we've done in the past, that we're always linked to them. There's a connection there to be found in the everyday. It's called Facing the Music. An ice cream van tinkled in the distance and Bob shivered, thinking his mind must be playing tricks. He'd read all about hypothermia and knew it slowed the heart and brought on hallucinations. He rubbed his eyes, worried he was about to see a 50-foot high cornet with a flake jammed in the top. His teeth began to chatter and he jigged on the pavement, stomping his feet. You didn't get used to it, whatever folks said. Bob shrugged deeper into his greatcoat, pricking the collar against the biting wind. His eyes leaked, the tears pooling quicker than he could blink them away. He told himself it was the cold that caused them. Bob crossed a yard where kids had chalked hopscotch grids on the flagstones. He was surprised kids still did such things when there were computers and countless other indoor distractions. He stared at the chalk until the lines blurred and the years fell away. He saw a playground with girls skipping and boys blasting a battered football using busted saplings for the goalposts. Away to the side, a smaller boy with a straight carroty fringe and shiny scuff-proof shoes stood watching, always watching, his bitten down fingers stuffed in his pockets. Bob had always been one for maths. Maths and music were his favourites, but getting an instrument had been out of the question. His father said they didn't have the brass and told that lame joke at every opportunity, thumping Bob high on the arm and bruising him to make the point. It hurt. His father had boxed in the army, had what he called a good dig. He said Bob wouldn't last five seconds in a boxing ring. You've got muscles like knots in cotton. Sometimes Bob would cry and retreat into his room, but still he caught fragments of the conversation, the raised voices through the floorboards, and his parents' chatter would always get louder and looser with the drink. He's a worry, I know that much, his father said. You're fussing, Brian, he's just sensitive, that's all. He's a wrong one with his music and his funny books, I'm telling you. Just leave him be, Brian. They tend to be good at it, though, don't they? His father said. Who does? You know what I mean. Their type's got a gift for that arty stuff. He'd go to the toilet and Mum would think she'd heard a creak and shush his father and slam the living room door so the frosted glass in the panel rattled. Mum was worried about all the carry-on with Bob's music and tried to steer him towards maths. One Christmas, Bob was given a navy blue tin with Oxford instruments written on the lid. As he opened the present, his father shook his head, cussing that what Bob should really want for Christmas was a football or a pair of boxing gloves. I had six bouts when you was your age. You're not normal. Bob's tin went everywhere with him, and people thought him strange, wondering why he preferred a set square or a compass to a bike. One day, Harris had waited for him after games and shook Bob against the wall so hard his breath had left him, and the rough bricks scraped at his knees and his knuckles. The tin tumbled from Bob's bag, and Harris jumped up and down on it, crumpling the lid. A small group gathered to watch his humiliation. He stood facing the brick, wouldn't look at them. And when they left, laughing and jeering, Bob picked up the broken, rattling tin, his hands shaking. He stretched his mouth fish-like to hold back the hot tears that made his vision swim. He opened the battered lid with a click and the contents, shards of broken, ruler, protractor and set square fell out. Only the compass was left. Bob stuck the point in his thumb and it pricked the skin and a tiny bubble of blood formed. Miss Hastings watched from the window, obscured by the winter's sun. She kept a close watch on him in class that afternoon. The next morning when they'd sung their hymns, Mr Hassel called for attention and said someone was to be the recipient of a special prize. Life-changing, he called it. Miss Hastings stepped up and plucked a folded tab of blue paper from a top hat while Mr Hassel built up the tension with a drum roll. Bob stared at the woodblock of the assembly floor, pleading, begging and offering up a silent prayer that it should be anyone but him. Miss Hastings held up the paper and folded it and said, The lucky winner is... Robert Myatt. His cheeks burned as he was called. He sat still, hands wedged between his legs, hoping they'd call someone else. They ordered him up and he learned he'd been chosen for piano lessons. The others glared at him. They didn't want the lessons, but it didn't stop them hating him for it. Bob slid on the pavement and gripped a road sign, his heart thumping. 
The flagstones were sparkling with frost and the street felt as if it had been waxed beneath his paper-thin soles. He shuffled on. Before long, he had no idea how long he'd been walking. He held a palm to shield his face as headlights swept into the avenue, casting him in spiky 40-foot shadows like a monster from a 50s sci-fi movie. He ducked through a broken fence with slats slick with green mould and waited, listening to distant sirens and the rattle of the railway carried on the wind. He pulled back a branch and saw a huge building with towering brick chimneys picked out against the moon. He scurried across the lawn, avoiding the telltale crunch of gravel and gripped a window ledge. He levered the window open with a braid, wincing as the wood cracked and splintered. He glanced over his shoulder, but there was nothing except the rustle of leaves. He gripped the frame and tumbled in, stumbling through the window feet first into a broken sink blocked with moss. He rubbed his neck, sickened by the fall and biting back the urge to vomit. The toilet opened into a corridor lined with plastic chairs. A reception desk at the end of the corridor had a glass hatch and wire pigeonholes stuffed with brittle paper. Bob followed a corridor tiled like a chessboard. At the end there was a set of double doors. Bob Freer peered through the doors and huffed on the porthole glass, buffing it to a shine with his elbow. He'd slept in plenty of these buildings before, unloved, forgotten, riddled with damp spores and crumbling plaster, littered with telltale clues of their past. He'd often found the same things as if there was a template for neglected offices and factories, the calendars of topless women on paradise beaches, the dog-eared index cards from the days before computers, dying cacti or spider plants, hanging in cradles of partle string. Bob squinted, struggling to see past the reflection in the glass. A smile played across his face. He grinned and his fingertips tapped out a rhythm on the door. He pushed through the doors, cracked his knuckles and walked to the stage, head bowed. He took a deep breath and stretched his trembling fingers as he climbed the steps. Get a grip, Bob, he said, and his heart raced. He sucked in a deep breath, tasting the dust. There was no stool, so Bob folded a strip of fusty curtain and knelt before the grand piano. He blinked and swallowed. The trick was not to block the bad thoughts, but to let them pass like clouds. He licked his cracked lips. His eyelid flickered like a moth trapped in a lampshade. It was useless. It all came back to him. There were rows of expectant faces staring below him. His bladder was full twitching from too much sugary tea. His mother was wearing her best hat with the ribbon and the pretend cherries. It was a moment she'd been waiting for months. There was an empty chair beside her. She was glancing along the rows to check she was being noticed. Yes, that's our Bob, all right. Miss Hastings coughed and whispered, In your own good time, Robert. For Miss Hastings and her mohair cardigans with the pearly buttons, he was always Robert. The fish and white sauce he'd had for tea burnt his throat. The stool was damp and itchy, and Bob tilted from side to side the way his father did when he tried to slip out a fart and blame the dog. Someone said something in the front row that punctuated the silence, and there were sniggers. It was Harris grinning from ear to ear, relishing Bob's discomfort. Bob saw him among the chairbacks and raincoats, and Harris got to his feet, pointing and laughing. It was odd, but it took Bob a moment to realise what everyone was staring at. There was a puddle beneath his stool. It shone like a bubble of mercury on the polished waxed floor beneath those stage lights. Bob ran from that stage, his shoes clattering on the boards. Outside in the car, his trousers itched. He was trying not to wriggle in the seat. He stared at the twinkling stars and wished he was up there anywhere but here. His mother shook her head, seemingly too exasperated to find words. Bob tried not to scratch his thighs, where they were sticky, or to fog the window with his breath. Well, that's fifty pounds well spent. The following morning, Bob feigned sickness, pushing his porridge round the plate till it stuck and gathered like putty, but she sent him to school anyway. Bob sighed. Now his mother was no longer here. There was no sign of Harris, who was probably in prison or, or running a high street bank. The hall was empty. There was no assembly to laugh, no damp patch, no questions about wasted tuition. Bob ran a hand across his scalp. That carroty fringe had retreated almost to the crown. It was damp with sweat. Miss Hastings' words drifted from backstage. 
in your own good time, Robert. He shuffled on the fusty curtain. He was rusty and it had been many years, but the notes came to him. Miss Hastings smiled and he nodded to her, and he played better than he could remember. Tears came, but through joy, not through the cold or the ache in his chest. His shoulders dropped, and though music cannot fill a hungry stomach, for a moment at least, Bob no longer felt the cold or the hurt.